The gentleman stepped up to the door of the manor house, holding his head high with the confidence of one befitting the position in his community. Reaching for the handle, he paused, confused. What day was it, he thought, staring at the door. He halted his natural inclination to step inside and present himself. Did it matter what day it was? After all, he was a person of some status and arrived here from... He paused again, furrowing his brow and turning to look back towards the path he must have taken to arrive here, though he had no memory of it. There was no handsome waiting after having dropped him off. This house and location was unfamiliar, but he turned back to the door. No matter. He must have arrived here for some reason, though not entirely certain at the moment. He took a breath and squared his shoulders, confident all would be clear once he was inside. The gentleman reached out again to grasp the handle and saw his gloved hand was trembling. His chest tightened and he swallowed hard. No, he thought, lowering his hand. He did not want to do this. He did not want to be here, and he certainly did not want to enter this dwelling. The door suddenly clicked and began to open slowly. The gentleman straightened up with feigned confidence as a wide foyer revealed itself. Inside was beckoning and cozy. A light waft of heat struck him and he suddenly realized how chilly he was, even in his greatcoat. He nodded thanks and crossed the threshold into the foyer, presenting himself, and was immediately unsure again as there was no one present to greet him. He looked around. Who opened the door? Hello? The gentleman spoke out. He walked ahead and peered into the empty parlor. This was suspicious. A feeling of deja vu began to come over him, and he shook himself. Superstitious, he mumbled, scolding. He suddenly remembered the open front door on the outside cold. He did not want to be rude. He turned to close the door and found it already closed. This caught his breath and goose flesh crept over his shoulders and ran down his back. Stiff upper lip now, he heard his father command in his memory. He straightened and took a breath, willing himself to calm down. Unease was taking hold and his stomach was tightening. He attempted to fight the fear slowly filling his chest. He raised his gloved hand and released a cough in an effort to deflect the moment when he spotted the front desk, also unoccupied. He looked around again. Perhaps it would be best if he just left, he thought, glancing into the parlor again, with its stiff back chairs and large, cozy-looking couch with a warm fire. Everything looked so inviting. Perhaps he should just sit and wait, but that too would be rude. Oh, there you are, a matronly voice said happily. The gentleman whirled to face an extremely dark-skinned woman who seemed to have suddenly appeared behind the desk. She was wearing a scarf wrapped around her head the way those Negro women do. Mr. Johnson? Well, now, ain't you just a sight? He swallowed uneasily, straightening with confidence, not daring to wonder where she had arrived from or who she served. Y- yes. His tone spoke of his station above her. The woman slipped from behind the counter wearing a voluminous frock, much nicer than ones worn by the common low class. She shuffled past him into the parlor to the fireplace and began stoking it up. Come on in here, sir. You have to catch a death out there. Oh, um, Yes. He entered the parlor and began removing his gloves as the woman came behind him to take his greatcoat. Her hands were icy. So much so he could feel the chill of her touch through his suit as her hands brushed against his shoulders. Both terror and titillation assaulted him simultaneously, but the warmth of the fireplace enveloped him and he relaxed after his greatcoat slid free. Make yourself comfortable, Mr. Johnson, and I'll fetch you some brandy. She turned, hung the coat on the rack, and left quickly. Mr. Johnson set himself down in the chair nearest the fire as the latch to the front door sounded. The next gentleman opened the door himself with slow curiosity, though he did not pause. Cautiously, he stepped inside, a bit older than Mr. Johnson. He too glanced into the parlor before crossing the foyer to the front desk to wait. After a moment, he looked into the parlor again, furrowing his brow at Mr. Johnson. The woman suddenly appeared from behind the front desk once again. Mr. Abel, welcome, sir, welcome. The woman gave him a broad smile as she slipped around the desk with a tray of four glasses surrounding a large bottle of brandy. She moved into the parlor and set the tray down on the table. Come right in, sir. I'll get your coat directly. She buzzed past him and entered the parlor. Comfortable, Mr. Johnson? I'll serve you once I tend to Mr. Abel. Uh, that's fine, Mr. Johnson said with a nod. Mr. Abel followed the woman, slipped into the parlor, and stopped at the entrance, uncertain. He gave Mr. Johnson a hard look while the man attempted to ignore him. Suddenly, the woman was behind him, breaking his concentration and removing his greatcoat as well. There you are, sir. Now sit yourself down while I serve you both a nice brandy and take the chill off. She hung the coat, then quickly moved over to the tray and poured two generous brandies, handing one to Mr. Johnson with a smile and a nod before turning to Mr. Abel, who was still standing. Mr. Abel, sir, find your place and make yourself comfortable. 
Mr. Abel seemed to snap back into the moment and absently took a seat on the couch. Uh, yes, yes, of course, he said, settling himself and taking the brandy the woman presented him with before quickly bustling off again. Mr. Abel looked at the brandy in the firelight and took a healthy swallow, feeling the alcohol burn in his throat and warm his stomach while the fireplace blazed just a little bit brighter and just a little bit warmer. The tension between the two gentlemen was evident. Mr. Johnson just about mustered the courage to address Mr. Abel when the woman re-entered the parlor with a cigar box. Gentlemen, cigars if you wish. The cigar box was covered with the most intricate design. Johnson and Abel both stared at the lid with some recognition until the box was opened and the design was hidden away. The woman straightened and looked around the room, satisfied. Now, will there be anything? Her words were cut off by the sound of the front door opening again. She looked out to see another gentleman stepping inside, still grasping the handle, and just as confused as the others. He stopped and looked back outside when, Mr. Catawalla! the woman exclaimed, rushing out of the parlor. Mr. Abel looked up questioningly, following her. The man at the door looked to the parlor and made note of the Negro woman approaching. She looked a proper house servant, skin black as coal in a discreet, proper frock, tight enough to reveal a voluptuous figure underneath. Everything a true man desires, he thought, caring enough in front and back for men to take notice. Come now, sir, the woman said, moving past him. She closed the door and ushered him inside. There now. Don't want nothing coming here, ain't oughtn't to be. She turned and smiled and began escorting him to the parlor. At the entrance, he looked over the men while allowing her to remove his hat and greatcoat, imagining a later encounter with her not stopping there. The woman sniffed the coat and shook it out with a mild face. The cigars are right next to the brandy, sir. Help yourself and have a seat while I tend to your things. Cadwaller took note of the two gentlemen in the parlor, but kept his eyes on the woman. Both men were obviously oblivious to the sumptuous grace of their dark-skinned hostess moving around the parlor, adding her scent to the air. Honeysuckle and cornmeal if he had to venture a guess. Just delicious, he thought, planning to investigate more later. He quickly chose a cigar and gave the two men a nod. Gentlemen, settling into a chair while the woman poured another generous brandy. She presented it to him and he settled back with the cigar and crossed his legs comfortably, eyeing her rear end as she moved away. Gentlemen, will there be anything else? The men didn't answer and the woman gave a proper nod before leaving the parlor. The men all sat drinking and smoking in silence while glancing around the room. Mr. Johnson and Mr. Abel remained settled in their unease, while Mr. Cattlewaller, uncaring or unaware of the tension, contentedly contemplated his cigar and the physical attributes of their hostess. Mr. Abel watched as Cattlewaller let his head fall back and contentedly blew smoke before leaning forward to choose a cigar. He snipped the end and lit it, taking a quick puff before nodding in contemplation. Mr. Cattlewaller, he said finally. Catawall raised her head. Yes? I find it interesting to see you here. Do you? Well, certainly. A man of your position. Well, now, I wouldn't say that. After all, I'm a gentleman, just as I am. Mr. Abel cut him off with the question. Yes, well, anyone. Well, would it interest you to know that I am not a gentleman, as it was you who stole my land and... The front door sounded again, opening as the woman reappeared. The men all glanced towards the entrance. Mr. Haynes, sir, come right in, come right on in. The woman seemed to dote on the man, much more so than the others. She took his coat and immediately hung it in the entrance before returning to take his arm, reverently escorting him to the parlor. She led him to a chair and allowed him to settle. Then she poured a brandy before choosing a cigar and preparing it for him. Mr. Haynes was visibly disturbed by all this attention, but offered no resistance to the woman. In his seat, he held both brandy and cigar, as if not certain what to make of them. Catawaller was obviously jealous, and his eyes followed the woman around the parlor with contempt, imagining how he would punish her for this later. Mr. Haynes, is you all right? The woman asked. Receiving no answer, the woman moved to the fireplace and quickly stoked it up. It is getting cold out there, ain't it? She added a log, then mumbled something beneath her breath, and suddenly the log caught, causing the fire to grow even more intense. There, now. I think that will just about do, gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you all. It is so wonderful to have the front door clicked and opened again. She stopped speaking and looked up in confusion. Um, excuse me a moment, gentlemen. Mr. Haynes watched her leave, visibly frightened, and began speaking as soon as she exited. Where the devil am I? The other men looked at him confused, though Mr. Catawaller was still at ease. I demand to know what the meaning of this is. Catawaller, is this your doing? I must say, I received word of your demise, but that must have been an exaggeration. 
Mr. Cadwaller stopped puffing on his cigar and looked at the man addressing him, his brow furrowing as he stared at Mr. Haynes. I beg your pardon? The woman reached the door as the fifth gentleman entered. She stopped when she saw his face. Mr. Roche, she said, breathless and confused. Mr. Roche, what are you... You ain't supposed to be here, sir. The man stood looking outside the door just as confused as the others, but when he was addressed by the woman, a Negro woman for that matter, he scoffed and closed the door defiantly. Nonsense, woman. Where else would I be? No, sir. You don't understand. You wasn't like the... Is that Catwaller? Mr. Roche said, ignoring her and heading past her into the parlor. No, I do not jest, sir. Your death, several months ago before the bank attempted to take my farm, but after you acquired my father's, paying no heed to the marauders who burned his fields and ravaged his stock. I swore to him on his deathbed that if I ever had the fortune to see you in person, I would tell you exactly what I thought of you. You are a cad, sir, and a fiend. You have no honor, and I find you grossly lax in any sort of compassion or humility. Catawaller was flushing. You forget yourself, sir! Catawaller! The tension in the room was suddenly broken as everyone looked up to see Mr. Roche standing at the entrance to the parlor. Is that you, man? Mr. Roche said with a laugh. How wonderful! He walked over and placed his hand on Catawaller's shoulder with a smile. Well, not surprising. You cheated everything else. Why not death? Am I right, old boy? Catawaller stared up at the man. Roche? Is that you? You've aged. Well, taking on your position at the bank has added some wrinkles and gray hairs. You haven't changed a bit. Five years. You look the same as the day... He stopped, looking around the room, and slowly began to take in the faces of the men turning pale. You? Roche began checking his coat for what might have been a pistol or a mace. I'll have you in irons. Mr. Haynes stood up. In irons, you say? The death of my wife, sir, on your account. You will have me in irons? I will have you killed. The two men suddenly went at each other, reaching over Mr. Abel, who attempted to move out of the way. Mr. Johnson stopped paying attention to the ruckus and stared at the woman now standing at the entrance to the parlor watching the men with cold delight as a sudden moment of clarity struck him. Cousteau! He sounded with shock and disgust so loudly the men ceased their struggle. At the sound of her name, the woman turned to face Mr. Johnson, menacing blaze in her eyes. Slowly she smiled. I must declare, Mr. Johnson, as you were the first to arrive, I did believe you'd be the first to recognize me. But it took you so long. The woman stepped calmly into the room as she spoke. The fire blazed even higher at her approach. I didn't know how the rest of you would be. Mr. Haynes, she said with a chuckle and a coup, I knowed I wasn't much back then, but you started sneaking me around for a hump when I was nine. I thought you might have recognized something, but I was nothing more than a dog you done set upon to have your way with. I expected to see you, Mr. Cadwaller, and you, Mr. Abel, but Mr. Roche, I don't know why you're here, sir. You weren't there, was you? My memory ain't feeling me that much. How long has it been? Twenty years? Her eyes gained a little sympathy as she crossed the room to Mr. Roche. What you done, sir? She pleaded. You was good to me. Tell me why you're here. What's this now, woman? Mr. Roche said, offended at being addressed by someone obviously beneath his station. She reached out and dared to take hold of his wrist, and he wrenched his hand in an attempt to free himself. But she was incredibly strong, and her ice-frozen grip burned. I got to know why you're here, she said, frantically tugging on his glove with her free hand until it came loose. She dropped it and, still holding his wrist, clutched his hand in hers. Roach winced at the electric touch of the woman who suddenly shuddered in shock. Oh, she exclaimed. Her jaw quivered and her face went slack with shock as her body convulsed. She began to choke. Oh, my daughter? Mr. Haynes' daughter? just a child. She grimaced. Her knees buckled and she dropped to the floor. Bowing before Mr. Roche, she sat on all fours, shaking her head and beginning to weep. Then she released a howling wail so loud and guttural the men went wide-eyed and winced in terror. Then, Marjorie Catherine Cousteau rose from the floor as a wind erupted around the parlor, sending the fire into a torrent of flame, causing the men to move away. The wind whipped the scarf from her head and her hair locks flailed as she began to chant head down and voice booming throughout the room. I done declared a curse on you all. All of you and any of yours who lays a finger on me and mine. I cursed you and told you I would see you again because I knowed I had a place in hell waiting for you. Catawar and the men went pale. Madame Cousteau, one of them spoke in remembrance. Roche suddenly realized who the woman before him was. 
where he was and what his fate would be. Terror seized him and he began stepping back. Cousteau looked up then, eyes dead and sunk in her face, a painted mask of hate, her mouth wide and hanging at an odd angle, her skin now burned and charred. The fireplace blazed at her whim. I'd be waiting a long time for this. The men stood in shock, frightened, witnessing their fate manifest before them. Mr. Roche, nearest the entrance, turned and ran. He stumbled from the parlor, falling and riding himself as he ran to the door as streaks and cries began emanating behind him. The sounds he heard were both of men and not of men, inhuman, guttural expressions of terror and pain, somehow conveying the retribution and reality of this new realm where they all resided. Roche reached the front door and yanked it open to reveal the outside realm where the others were waiting, waiting for them to experience them, to play with and taste them. They and Madame Cousteau as well, for it was hell after all, and the witch Cousteau did have a place reserved. Roche stood in the doorway, staring into the landscape that was both a strange and overwhelming sight of land and not land, of earth and not earth, of creatures that had once been alive and some that had once been human, and others which had never been either. An unmentionable thing with knowledge of pleasures and pains far beyond all human experience came forward. It had never been human, but it loved and loved with the taste of humanity. If Roche had piss or bowel to loose on himself, then he would have done so right there. But as it was, he had only emotion, and of that only terror which broke his last semblance of humanity. Dear God. The creature was already eating, drinking, and tasting all that he was, and reached out from the emptiness. It wrapped something very like a tentacle around Roche, and spoke in a language no human had ever heard. God. No. It said, causing blood to emit from Roche's eyes and ears. Roche was then yanked into the nothing. He went so fast he came right out of his shoe. He also left his greatcoat when his feet touched the back of his head and his arms clapped behind him. It remained, fluttering for half a moment before crumbling on the steps of the manor house and the front door slammed shut behind him.